One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. So welcome to Security Guy Radio. So what's your name? My name is, oh God, now the tough questions. You start with that? Cut. Thank him. Okay. <laughs> we actually should play this. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome to Security Guy Radio. What's your name? Mark Berger. And what do you do? I'm the president and founder of a company called Securitech. I'm also the chief product officer. Oh, founder. I like that. That's yeah. cool. All right. And what do you guys do? We manufacture innovative locking solutions. All right. Which are crazy things that go on doors. I bet the first uh, security convention was with locks. Old as the hills, right? Pretty much. And they're kind of underrated now, because everything's all high-tech and digital and blah, 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 but locks, at the end of the day, are what we need to keep things secure. Right, there are two things. There's always the security part of it, and there's always the safety part of it. Right, right. So mechanical locks have to go on doors, because the safety part has to keep the door latched, nothing else to prevent the spread of fire in many locations. Right. And then the security part, of course, is where all the concentration is, prevent forced entry, access control, and all the elements that go in place. Now when you say manufacture, I see, we're going to do a visual in a minute. There's a lot of crazy designs around here. I mean, this is really cool stuff. Thank you. And so you come up with a spec sometimes or a design and you say, hey, let's make this or these are existing models or what? Well, those are good questions and the answer to everything you've asked is yes. Okay. So as I walk through each product over here, I can probably tell you what was the inquiry that began the uh, creation of the product. Sometimes it's someone who's just asked for one product or one particular function, we figured that out, and that leads us into several others. How long have you been in business? Since 1983, I'd do the math for you, but that would be too complicated. <laughs> I just started the academy in 83. I know the math, believe me. Okay. I got the white hair for that. Nice. All right, so here's what I haven't been asking uh, people I've met. How do you start a lock business, a cybersecurity business, an IT business? That's a lot of work. It is. We think of people as the giant, you know, Tyco Stanley's or the corporations, that's a different thing. But you're doing some really good work with some really interesting products, your design and build. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you get into that? Well, a couple of things. Anybody that's giant didn't start off as a giant. That's true. You always start off yeah. at a certain level, and it generally starts off with an idea. Our nucleus started in the uh, New York City in the early 80s when crime was still a factor. No, a lot of drugs back then. A lot of cocaine when I was working in the streets, a lot of stuff going on. Okay. Um, and our Break-ins were a major factor back then, right. and we started with multi-point locking, with the concept being that if you lock several sides of the door, you can't penetrate or break through the door. Now, this is really interesting. Did you invent this? We invented certain versions of this. The idea okay. of multi-point locking, if you watch the movie King Kong, when they slid that yeah, bar yeah, yeah. across those two doors to keep Kong out, that's multi-point This locking. is a New York thing, okay? Because but, you yes. don't see these locks in LA, and you see them in all the movies about New York, mm -hmm. all the multiple locks, the multiple right. points and stuff. Okay. Now, why is that specific to New York? I mean, well, let me, let me, let me start with something over here. Right. We did them in New York internally inside the door, right. where we used to have to send an installer out and, and chop up the door and put locks in. They look good afterwards, but it oh, was Oh, you mean inside involved. the door itself? It, right, the frame, okay. within the door. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that you don't see these types of things in LA. You probably don't, because you'd never see the, the uh, back side of the door, you just see the outside that has a cylinder right. where you turn it. Right. Okay. This was actually originally designed for a, an application in LA. Remember I told you before that yeah. everything started with the nucleus? Right. Those are the only things I remember. We got a call from someone who was designing a door that would be underneath the stadium seats where they were going to be storing um, sports equipment. Okay, I know exactly what you're talking about, right? And yeah. they didn't, so it was an odd little odd shaped little door, right. and they didn't want to have people breaking in and stealing the sports equipment. And if he knew, if he only locked on one side of the door, they'd take a crowbar right. and both the doors. So we wanted to lock top and bottom. He'd heard about our locks. we have done trade shows and we were known. The problem was his door was not going to be a regular inch and three quarter door that we normally work with. It was just going to be a steel panel. So oh, he was steel, wondering, he was, yeah. he was wondering how can he install our lock on a steel panel? So I started thinking about it and I said, well, you know what, if I took some aluminum tubes and we bolted the tubes to the door, then you don't actually need a door, we can mount the lock inside the tube. And from that concept or idea of satisfying his need of putting it inside the tube, we built a steel housing, smaller channels, 
and we took a lock that had been inside the door and turned it into a surface-mounted lock. Yeah. So from New York to LA and now every place in between, uh, if you have bought a cell phone, the odds are it's been stored inside a uh, stock room protected by one of these multi-point locks. Interesting. Very interesting. So you're nationwide? Yep. How do you distribute your business? Through traditional contract hardware distributors, through uh, locksmith distributors, through uh, specialty loss prevention distributors. There's a special channel that deals right. with those folks. Systems integrators. Now, we're not going to see your stuff at Builders Emporium. I'm dating myself. Correct. That's old school. No, right, <laughs> right. So we don't sell into the do-it-yourself uh, And from the channel. business point of it, why? I've seen other manufacturers that do it that way. Why do they choose the distribution you choose? This is a business This is a logical question. question. Generally, our products are not the uh, simplest products to install that a homeowner should really oh, do Oh, I see, themselves. okay, makes sense. This is a one step above putting furniture together from Ikea. Now, do you use, uh, you have the locks, and I, I gotta get my, my terms right. The lock is, and then there's a cylinder. There you go, okay, okay. it's so, a good question. Yeah. We, we don't manufacture cylinders. Okay. So one of the reasons that we don't sell directly to end, any end user is that you'll always need something from someone else to make our lock work. That's what, Okay, that's, that's good clarification. Right. right, so whether it's an access control system which sends a signal, or whether it's a um, regular keyed lock, that key control has to come from someone else. Right. So Securitech manufactures the locking element, and the cylinder is going to come from a third party. And the cylinder can be, uh, can you handle things like, uh, you know, what's what's the high-end one? Uh, uh, Medico. Medico, or, right. yeah. So exactly. that it all fits whatever you're, you're exactly. making. Exactly. Right. right. So manufacturing of a lock, what goes into that concept? And I, and the reason I ask, and I remember, I can't remember all my terms, but when I was at the studios, I was in charge of security, so I had to go out and vet look at people, look at companies, right. take bids, and that kind of thing. And then one day they said, uh, I want to put in medical keyways and, and mortise locks, and they said, no, no, it's too expensive. We're going to value that out. Right. So they put in the cheapest <laughs> Yale locks or something, right? And then, of course, the CEO got locked in his office for about five hours, and that was a big problem, because it failed, right? Right. That's So what's your feeling on on quality versus pricing? Is there a difference in a, in a functionality of an inexpensive lock set opposed to a more expensive lock set. Right. And okay. what, what goes into those components? Those are good questions. If someone's buying our lock set, they're not buying a value, in general, a value engineered piece. Okay. What they're looking for is durability. We don't want somebody getting in, you're, you're, nobody's getting in your door, that's the idea. Well, the design. there are certain things. There is code compliance, right. so that I can add security to the door, and yet exit in a single motion. Okay. So remember, I'm going to always bring everything back to the safety side, because right. we engineer in the safety side. So. If someone's not interested in code compliance and are wanting to risk people's lives, yeah, they can buy inexpensive things and throw a $4 slide bolt on the door and consider it security. Right. Someone could die behind it, but you know what? They Well, you know, I think money. most people don't think that way. They think, oh, it's a lock. It's going to get me in or out. Not necessarily. Right. You're right. right. We call that uh, uh, fail safe or fail secure right. if it's in lock electronic locks in a, in a well, broadcast. Well, yeah, those are, they're, it's very tricky because you've got two sides of a door. You've got your ingress and your egress. So your ingress, from the street side, you always want to be fail secure in most cases, so that with the loss of power, right. somebody can't just walk in. Your interior, I don't really use the same term fail safe. I use the term free exiting. And the reason I use free exiting is that it has nothing to do with power, it has nothing to do with locking. If I'm on the inside, I have to be able to exit freely at all times. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, on a stairwell, for re-entry, because you asked, in most jurisdictions it's every fourth floor, in some jurisdictions every floor, if I'm in a stairwell and I'm trying to exit in the event of a fire and I've got locked doors from the stairwell, every fourth floor typically, that stairwell door on the ingress side has to allow me back onto a floor. So that would be fail safe, where with the loss of power, that would become unlocked. Yeah. Some jurisdictions that's every floor, the reason they do every fourth floor is that if I'm inside the space, I never have to move more than two floors up or two floors down to be able to uh, exit back so onto the uh, I building. I was always torn between that, and my emotion between fail safe and fail secure was always decided by the fire department, mm -hmm. but only the particular inspector, because one week it's this way and one week it's the other. That happens, right, unfortunately? It's tricky. I, I yeah. chair the Builders Hardware Manufacturers Association Codes and Government Affairs Committee. So I deal with a lot of AHJs, authorities having jurisdictions, a lot of fire marshals, things like that. 
I, I used to be for fail secure, so you can't go back in the building if everything goes to crap and the right. zombies start attacking, we don't want the zombies coming in. But now with active shooters, let me get your thoughts on that. I'm all for egress. I want the first responders to get in any way they think is tactically safe and handle that situation in a shooting situation. Right. Do you find a trend in the industry where people are starting to think, you know what? Maybe I ought to keep it open. School locking, if you've got an hour, I'll come in and I'll do a show with you. Because oh, you it's should, a, it's, absolutely. It's, it's a very big That's topic, a very show. hot topic yeah. right now. Okay, there are a couple of things about school locking. Number one, schools are now castles and moats, which means that the perimeter of the school should have one door for entry, and that's the primary location into a school. Right. Okay. First they responders. Should. We still don't see it. But well, you see it very often yeah. right now. Um, the first responders, typically in a community, will have the key to enter through that door. Okay. If they don't, every first responder has a key that's about four foot tall. Yeah. That they will use to enter through that the glass that's right. on the side of the door, or to separate the door to come. Are in. they using knox boxes that were traditionally right. by fire departments or police right. utilizing those? Correct. So, okay. those, so they have they have pretty fast access in. All right. The need for speed, which you've talked about in a school, is not so much for first responders to enter. The need for speed is the ability to lock the classroom down as quickly as possible. Okay, that's a good point. So if I'm a teacher, I should not have to go and hunt for my key and my purse, right. wherever it is in the room. I should not have to then have to write a run to the door and insert my key into the door under duress. Right. My goal, get my kids to a safe haven within the classroom and lock the door as quickly as possible. Now one thing, and I teach active shooter response and prevention and all that kind of stuff, right? And one thing that people always forget about and you, you just hit on it, which is the duress, is that if you lock your door like this every single morning and that's your routine, when somebody starts shooting, that's not your routine. There is no routine. There is no routine unless correct. you train for it, right? So, Even if you train for well, it, you have to train a the lot best too. trained people, yeah. how much time is going to elapse between your training and God forbid an event Well, happens. that's what I mean. By my definition of training, mm -hmm. it's ongoing. It's all the time. We do drills, right? Right. Now, what do your locks do that can help with that situation? Okay. Uh, we it, have, you know, like, I love this one here where there's just a flip, and if you're on the inside of the classroom when I'm flipping it, right. I'm secure in that classroom. Well, believe it or not, this is on computer classrooms in New York City. When we talked about break-ins in the yeah. 1980s, one of our big activities was, it's an interesting story, um, Microsoft and IBM got together to donate classrooms to the New York City school system. They delivered their first load on a Friday afternoon. They put them in a room, prepared to install them on Monday morning. Want to finish the story? Yeah. They didn't disappear, did they? Oh, shocking. Good heavens. Yeah, there was not a single one. So Microsoft and IBM said, before we provide you with any more computers, you have to give us a reasonable insurance that they're going to be installed in classrooms right, and not sure. disappear. So we did multi-point locking, retrofitting to existing classroom doors in the New York school system for that purpose. Now, fast forward 30 years later, the concern is not protecting the computers. People. The concern is protecting it's the students people, inside yeah. the right. So there, the issue is the need for speed. And if you want, I have a product I can show you that will talk about the instant ability to lock the door, yeah, yet that, provide single motion egress. And intuitive, because a, a five-year-old ought to be able to figure out that, listen, I, if That's the teacher's the down, I That's gotta the be able key. to do it. The teacher may not be the closest person to right. the door. You want someone to have it intuitive and easy to do, but not ordinary and normal that it's like their lock at home where they would do it all the time right. by accident. Now, what are, school shootings, of course, the highest priority because of children, right? But right. we get these kind of things in workplaces as well. Right. What, are, what are corporations or businesses doing differently in the lock business now because of this uh, potential threat? Right, workplace threats are all, again, the same castle and moat idea where you're segregating areas. We grew up, I, I remember going to Kennedy Airport and you could almost walk to the gate with people oh, that yeah, were departing. Oh yeah, that's true, right. a whole different That doesn't ballgame. exist anymore, right. right? Think of how many movies that have to change the yeah. ending now because you can go run to the gate at the last moment. That's right. Okay? That's true, that's true. Whole different lifestyle. Yeah, that's right. Now. Okay, so airports became the first secured areas. Offices are being secured. We're going to see levels of security in malls. We're seeing it in movie theaters now because of shootings. It's a different world. We have to adapt to it protecting, but also maintaining life safety and exiting. So you're seeing things going on. We work with the U.S. Postal Service. They're the greatest, those guys. Yeah, they are, they are so on top of the situation, and they had to deal with active shooter situations long before anybody else in right. society. And their goal was to protect the environment from ingress, but make sure that if you were anywhere in one of their facilities and you heard something going on, your nearest exit was free and clear, and you could exit out. Now, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was the crash bar that had a delayed opening. 
Right. Gives you five seconds. There's plenty of delayed egress. That's a code. And that's still okay to it's use. It's code allowed, yeah. Okay. Uh, I had that installed at one of the studios, and we had an instrument people had to get out, and when they couldn't get mm -hmm. out in the panic, they figured it didn't work. They didn't wait five seconds. Five seconds. Well, their signage, well, it's usually 15 or 30, and yeah, you well, probably had a 30 second back then. In an emergency, 30 seconds is an eternity. Long time, yeah, yeah. Right. So there are a couple of things. Number one, um, where you use emergency egress and you have delayed egress, code requires signage on the door. Right. Code requires an audible countdown, either by beeping, and there's some no, that actually Oh, I don't think we had numbers. that. It's interesting. Okay. You were in the early days yeah, yeah. when you were doing it, things like that. So the code. Those are still popular, though? The With delayed egress is used and it's allowed in many locations. Interesting locations where it's used, Alzheimer's wards. Oh, of course, that's a, that's a perfect application, yeah. right, because there's right. no emergency other than them, right. well, it could be, but them leaving because of their condition. Right, yeah. retail is a large application with delayed egress because people yeah. use what I call alternate cashier locations where there's no right. cashier, so they decide they'll mail in a check later and run out the side door. Now, these are, I'm looking at them, and we're going to take some pictures of them. These are good old-fashioned, all American steel, right? Impenetrable, you know, heavy really, duty, really heavy, right? Right. But are there are there electronic components in some of these there things are, nowadays? Essentially, what we've taken is any lock that we have with multiple point locking yep. can also be released to provide uh, entry through an access control. They make system. me nervous because power goes out, the battery dies, whatever. Are you are you locked and, and out of luck if it's in the Let's lock? Let's go mode? back to what we taught you before: free exiting at all times. No, I get it on but, a mechanical but, lock, but, but fail I'm, secure. But on an electronic, electronic lock, how do you? But know? our electronic locks are all just releases of mechanical applications. Oh, so it's always it's the spring load is is the mechanical locking is always there. Electromagnetic locks have the issue that they're dependent upon power like for the lock. door holding yeah. force. Do you make mag locks, by the way? We don't. We we can supply some with our products. Right, right. Securitech generally is a company. If somebody else makes it, we don't. Yeah. We may use elements of it, right. but we don't produce those elements. Right. This is, this is really fascinating. Thank you. And it's back to basics, right? Pretty much, there's simple and, principles. Oh, high tech, blah, blah, right. blah. You gotta have a good lock set and make it work. Right. Let's Perfect. take a little quick break and we'll take a look at some sure. other stuff. Sure, that'd be great, thank oh, you. Great. So, what we're going to talk about now is what you referenced before, which is classroom locking. And really what it comes down to is if I had a child in a classroom and I had a teacher who was supposed to protect them, three words come to mind, and those three words are need for speed. Right. I want my teacher to be able to lock the classroom door as quickly as possible while my child is being ushered over to a safe haven in the classroom, and all of this should happen within three seconds. Yeah, okay. an average shooting is about three minutes, and you gotta move fast. Right, and they're going to go, from an opportunity point of view, is essentially all locks are, and all we're doing is we're in delay mode. Right. If it's in, if you can't break into one place, you're going to move someplace else. Our goal is to make it inconvenient for you to right. break into one place. Similarly, with a classroom, with the need for speed, what we want the teacher to be able to do, and I don't know if you can see this over here. I'll turn this around. This is our QID lock set, and what we tab is a traditional classroom lock set where the key is used to lock and unlock the outside lever, and that's usually what a classroom function lock is. But what we've added is below the lever a red button. Oh, that's interesting. Can you uh, maybe turn that a little flatter? We can take it a little close on it. Okay, like that. Yeah. I'm not that strong. I can't hold it for this long. Okay. There you go. All right. All right. Interesting. Okay. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to press the red button, and it's going to do two things. It's going to project a deadbolt, and it's going to lock the outside lever. Oh, interesting. Now the idea behind this lock came so that if the door is open, I'm the teacher, my goal is to concentrate on students and move them into a safe area. What I'm going to do is come to the door, put my hand on the handle, not even look, bring my thumb down, press the red button, and lock the door. So in one motion, as long as I pass the door, all I have to do is get my hand on you the lever. You can almost be jogging past that door and grab that thing. As fast yeah. as you can. Yeah. Now, my belief is that schools, just as we have training drills where we get on an airplane, right, how to oh, buckle yeah, a yeah. seatbelt, yeah. training drills where you take a cruise, you go out, they have the muster. Right. You have a training drill when you go to a movie theater now, because before the movie starts, they're identifying where the exits are. Yeah, that's so true. So after they've told you to turn off your cell phone and buy popcorn, 
They're telling you how to get out in the event of an emergency. Right. So that's all coming out right now. And you know, it's helpful because that subtle thing, you know, you see a couple movies a month, you remember it. Right. It works. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're, we're accustomed now to having safety drills. You can call them security drills, they're really safety drills. Same thing is the first day of school, every student should be taught that in the event of an emergency, your responsibility is to go, who's ever closest to the door, used to call them the hall monitor, right? The kid that's right. closest to the right. door, right? Whoever's closest to the door, don't wait for the teacher to go to the door. If you hear that school alarm go off, you go and you press the red button to and lock the door. And what kid doesn't like to push buttons? Kids it's a love no to push buttons. That's right. Now, part of that drill, because it's important that you say that, is the first day of school, you line every student up and every student presses that button. So they all have the opportunity to do it and they all know what's being done. Right. Now the other part of that is, is why it's so important, is number one, is if I was a kid, I'd spend the whole year waiting for my chance to press that red button. Yeah, no, it's true. So there I've done it the first day. The second is that you learn that you have to really press the button. You can't just touch it. And when you press the button, you that's get a what response. locks it. Right. But if you just brush up against it, it's not going to project. How young a child could push that, do you think? They can. Grade school? I mean, grade school. Way down. Right. I don't know if kindergarten kids are quite the age. Second but grade, second yeah, grade right. third grade should be Makes able sense, to do right. it. And some first grade kids are going to be big enough to be able to do it as right. well. Uh, it's not too hard. We don't use a turn piece that would be normal like they'd see on their home lock. Right. It's a very specific red button below the lever. That's the key to making this thing operate properly. It's, uh, now that you've said it this way, I get it. I would have gone with make it familiar, but you need to make this special. Right. It has to be super special. Right. And important so the kids go, hey, we got a problem, I got to right. of course. So yeah. red always detects emergency. Right. If it was normal, it'd be too easy for the kids to flip it over and say, hey, I didn't do that, no, you know. Exactly, right, right, right. right. Here, that's an emergency, and you treat it like the emergency alarm in the school where you let them know there's a penalty if you press this at the wrong now, time. Now, is this your design? That's our design, yes. It's brilliant. Is it patented? It's patent pending. Patent pending, excellent. That's what we do, yeah. It's a security guard radio exclusive. I like to find these products that are like vertical and niche and like really okay. specialized. That's a brilliant. That's well, the entire Securitech company is all about verticals and niches and special applications. Yeah, this is That's fabulous. What now, uh, what is something like that going to cost me? List price on this item is $770. That seems pretty reasonable to me. What did you get out of it, especially? Yeah. Uh, and, and it retrofits into the exact existing mortise opening in the school. Well, oh, that's good, because that could be an extra expense, right? If it's right. if it if you get retrofitted. Correct. Uh, explain to people what a mortise lock is, because okay. that's a, a right. term you hear all the time. Right. For door folks, the way to tell what type of lock you have in your door, open your door sideways. If you see an eight-inch opening, you've got a mortise lock. It comes from the old terms in wood doors where they used to have to mortise out of pocket yeah. to put the lock inside the door. That pocket was called a mortise. Oh, okay. So this is called a mortise lock. The alternative would be a cylindrical lock where you'd see a small two and three quarter inch Oh, the throw plate. bolt, yep. Well, not for the deadbolt, but for, oh. the, for the latch. Oh, okay. Almost like a key and knob lock like you'd see it in your home. Right. That would be the other type of lock that's in the school. And we have a QID solution for that as well, where we install a secondary lock and a different trim on the inside. So we have solutions in that space So here's too. my pet peeve on this sort of stuff with schools. Why isn't this? I hate to say a law because I don't like a lot of laws, even though right. I was a cop, right? But really, for kids, why isn't this mandatory? Why isn't this in every school in the country? It's just a no-brainer. And I know a lot about security, right? This right. seems like one of the best solutions I've ever seen. Thank you. Simple and okay. mechanical. And, and by the way, is that going to break? No. It's not, right? Well, hope it's not. Electric not. Okay. lock could break. There's well, power. It's a this question is... of how our society values things when we get around to it. Yeah. So hopefully we get to things before the horse leaves out of the barn. Securitech as a company likes to be reactive, likes to come up with solutions that help prevent the next issue that comes up. We work very well with school districts. We will customize products to meet their needs. Security is not a very fast moving um, no, it just response isn't. that people have. Purchasing products takes a life cycle. Um, school districts are going to complain about being terribly underfunded in many different priorities. Yeah. And we respect that and we understand that. But Securitech as a company is the go-to for innovation and technology. And we're very proud that when they built the new school in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, it was our locks that were selected. Oh, fabulous. For those classroom in the doors. bid, before you start breaking it ground. Was specified. It was yeah. the specified. The security yeah. consultant worked on developing something very specific, not the red button, 
the Connecticut requirement is every door locked continuously. Right. So we've come up with a solution for them that works with some of the other systems now, they put together. You could put that in continuous lock on the outside, but it's I assume it's it's open unless you push the red button. Right. So it works hopefully 100% of the time. Otherwise, 99.99% of the time, this should work like a regular classroom lock. And classroom locks work where you turn the key and they lock and unlock the outside lever. So what do you find is the standard? I, I used to recommend that every classroom keep the door locked from the outside. And of course, they all come back with, well, I, I, what if I have to go get my coffee and I, I don't have my keys? And it's inconvenient and I got to stop when the kid comes from the hall to bring in a pass. Very few school districts will have all their classroom doors locked Still, all the they don't, right? It's bizarre. So it's one of the safest things they can do to delay somebody. Uh, the Virginia Tech shooter, right? I'm sorry? The Virginia Tech guy, the shooter, right, in the school? Yeah. Uh, the one class he didn't get into is the one where the, after the guys got shot, they went and locked it and he right. shook the door and went to the next Excellent. one, right? Yeah. yeah. That's what we talk so about. You're still the need finding for that speed. standard. You're still finding the standard the of, well, speed. keep it open for now and all kinds of right. things. Right. Well, at least if this product is here, they can lock it and be safe. There are alternative products out there. There are products being created that respect the need for speed. For a school district with unlimited funds, we have a version of the QID where the teacher could wear a pendant around the neck. Oh, it's just going to ask you electronically. You wouldn't even have to approach the door. Right. You just press the button, and if you want to watch this one over here. Oh, here, let me see if I can get that a little closer. Hold on. Okay. When I press the button, I have to line this up. Well, that should have happened. Oh, someone put this upside down. Oh, all right. I apologize. That's right. Go ahead. So when the so now imagine someone's left walked out, bolt automatically projects. Interesting. So I will do that again with the uh, strike plate in the right position. So here we're looking at the frame as if the door wasn't there. Teacher has the pendant, presses the button. That's cool. Automatically projects. Now, outward. could you put this on a network and have a, uh, you know, one you person a one hit a button, button lock the whole school for yep. the whole school? One button lockdown for the school. Yeah. See, simple solution. It's a simple solution. It's an expensive solution. So we've seen this being used in some private schools, some other locations like that. But for fairly large school districts, it's probably way out of their budget. Yeah, cost prohibitive, and you yeah. know, in a pri my kids went to private school. Um, if they need something, they ask the parents for money, and the parents either gave it to them or guess what. Sometimes they said, no, we're not going to give it to you. But uh, I'll, I'll do my standard line. Not, not a rich school either, by the way. Okay, private, every rich. parent will tell you that their greatest treasure, their greatest value is their children. That's right. Who's the least expensive employee that you have? Uh, what, at school? No, no. In, 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 your, in generally, if you're, if you're a homeowner, the least expensive employee that you have. I'll not jump to close. Your babysitter. Oh, okay, right. So your most valuable possession. Yeah, that's true. He's now being protected by your least valuable. He's one that's cheaper. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, I was in the guard business for a long time, right? Yeah. And you want me to guard your uh, gold-plated, uh, you know, widget, and you only want to pay the guard nine dollars an hour? Really? I, I, I don't get it. Right. That's how things that's work. That's how it works. Yeah, it is kind of okay. weird. This is really, really Great. good. Anything else you want to show me? I think we're good over here on this. All right. Okay. Um, we'd like to go through at some point our electric locking, uh, but that takes a fair amount of time. So. Well, you got. Uh, you're at 30 minutes, we can, okay. it's up to you. You're probably gonna get back to some sales too. So. Yeah, I've actually got to actually jump to all right, a event. so this uh, is great. Event. So uh, we'll start with this. We'll show you one other item if we all can. Right, real quick, all right. Okay, real quick. Okay. All right, who's the beer guy? Yes, is, that, is that a beer lock? Okay, <laughs> we got a beer lock. Okay, all right. So we'll we do one, right final, one final product. All right. And I actually have to take it to an event. All right, go ahead. So let me turn off the, uh, theme song. <laughs> okay. So this is our Bluetooth controlled electric release trim. Oh, Bluetooth. Cool. Yep. All right. All right. So I'm going to ask you to hold the mic for me for a second Go while ahead. I demonstrate this. Okay. So basically what I do is what I what I'm going to do is take my phone, open up my application, and then the dark green door is the or key is the door that's nearest by. I press the button and I can open the door. That's awesome. Okay. Battery powered locally or you need No, power? it's hardwired. Hardwired. Hardwired, all right. Okay. But the software is by a company called Easy Key. It's their VizPin software. So Securitech, as I mentioned before, we don't create act make access control systems and we don't provide cylinders. But we've teamed with um, the good folks at uh, VizPin to be able to release the doors 
electrically and instantly. That is really cool. Right. How much does that cost? Uh, that's about a thousand dollar list price for the hardware and the uh, release. I, I buy one for my house, except you could go through my balsa wood door. It wouldn't, right. <laughs> wouldn't serve a purpose. Secure Attack is not really in the <laughs> residential side <laughs> of the street. We're more yeah. in the uh, industrial. Here is a location where if you want to add credentials to people and provide them the ability to enter, right. you never have to see them. They download the app and you can, once they're online, you can then assign them time zones. They could be for an hour, a week, a month, a day. SPG is doing a, yeah. is doing a Bluetooth lock. Right. So you they're, arrive and your phone's your key to your hotel. Right, so this would be for other applications in that sense. Right. Great. Mark, it's beautiful. Thanks for coming in. Sure. I really Thank you for the time. It. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right, welcome to Security Guy Radio, sir. What's your name? My name is Tom Carnival. I'm the founder and CEO of Century 360. You know, I'm I'm finding more founders and and starter ups this year. It, it's amazing. It yep. takes a lot of work to do that. Uh, you know, there's been a buzz the past three years of you know these entrepreneurs now becoming rock stars, and I uh, I like to say I started a company before it became cool. So I've been doing this uh, a little while now, about ten years, and overnight success in ten yeah, years. Yeah, right. exactly. That's, That's what, how it always happens, right? So what do you guys do? What do you specialize in? So we are an American brand that develops advanced, intelligent video surveillance cameras. Why is that different than an average off-the-shelf kind of camera? So what, what we're really focused on is, is, is reducing the amount of cameras you need to secure your environment with panoramic vision. So, oh, that's important. So we create uh, a single sensor, single lens, low cost, uh, low failure rate surveillance camera that sees everything in all directions with no blind spots and no moving parts. That's amazing. Uh, my, we're shooting this on GoPro yes. and I'm, I'm Three feet away from you, but I'm seeing your entire booth. It's fascinating. Correct. Same kind of concept. Similar, right? right. So, if so, it's a, this is a, you know your GoPro now is kind of directionally mounted, right? right. So, if we had a hotel lobby or a ER emergency room or a parking lot, our types of cameras would be mounted looking down and around. So, it so obviously in the sky we're not recording, but the, the our panoramic vision of our lens, our fisheye lens, right. is actually pointed straight down. And what we've done is ha created an algorithm called de-warping. De-warping is the process of correcting a fisheye's perspective lens. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the samples here, and yep. they're flat, yep. but it's technically it's a fisheye look exactly. and shot that way. Exactly. So if we were to show you the de-warped view, you would not necessarily be able to differentiate that it is a fisheye until we show you that, yes, this is actually capturing everything and so you know I've been doing this for a lot of years and it's funny I come to these trade shows and, and it's really exciting to see people say well wait a second there's no moving parts with this isn't there a PTZ isn't there a motor in there when they see us panning and tilting and zooming around but really it has no moving parts and no blind spots so it's digital PTZ exactly right so it's all done with software now how long does it take to to I'm going to call it stitching. Maybe that's not the right word. It isn't actually. Okay. It isn't. So <laughs> okay. it, you know, stitching is, uh, no is editor, actually cut the, that the, out. the no. So stitching. No, it's, I'm glad you brought it up. It's a it's a clear differentiator, right? right? So stitching is is connecting multiple sensors together. Okay. Right. That's not we're we're doing dewarping, which is actually one sensor, one one wide angled lens in software correction. How long does it take to dewarp an image? Is it real time? Oh yeah, it's real time. That's amazing. Instantly. Very interesting. Yeah. All right, so give me some applications. What are your biggest users in this? Um, so mass transit and rail, so Chicago Transit Authority. Oh, that's um, a big one. Uh, so we have over 9,000 cameras deployed. 9,000? Yes, sir, for the CTA. Wow. So if you come to my hometown of Chicago. I come there all the time, I love and Chicago. You and you ride the blue line, brown line, purple line, or any of the rail cars, you look up in the ceiling and our camera's right there. Now, uh, I did security for Fox and Disney, and I okay. had about 250 cameras. Sure. And I'm <laughs> funny story, I wish I had one of these, yeah. right? So we had everything, I'm, I'm you know, really diligent about this. I, I thought I had everything covered. I get a call one day from one of my facility workers, yep. slip and fall, he fell down and hurt himself. All right, well, that's no good, we gotta make sure you're sure. okay. Yeah. Let's turn the camera back, guess where he fell? He fell within a two foot blind spot of course. that I just physically could not cover because yep. of whatever reason, right? He knew, because yep. he, he watches all our cameras Absolutely. and a lot of them, right? This would have solved that. How many cameras, like a rough estimate, would one of your lenses replace five six? It depends. It's okay. gonna. It's gonna. It's gonna. All the variables are gonna depend. Indoor, outdoor. How high is the ceiling mounted? What is the area of car coverage? So, so you know, you know, as you clearly indicated, traditional cameras' biggest weakness 
is the blind spot, right? You point the camera to the left, something inevitably is gonna happen on the right oh, and you're gonna miss right. it. That's right. Right. And the other big issue is resolution. Even in 2015, I wish we could say that we're seeing on the news crystal clear images of suspects. No, we're not. That we're not. No. Still, and that's still a major problem, and that's why I love waking up in the morning doing what we do. Not because not because that still exists, but because there's still a big problem to solve in our in our world. Back when uh, you know analogs cameras were the thing, uh, yeah. couldn't really help that, right? And what I always thought was interesting is that we know it's a crappy picture to begin with. Right. So why are you putting the camera up in the corner and shooting down right. on the guy's bald spot? Yep. Legally, you can't identify the guy. Absolutely. It's useless. And I know my camera was stolen, by the way, because I don't have it anymore. Right. So I don't need your camera to tell me that, right? Mm -hmm. How does your software and your uh, optics fix that problem because if it's a very wide wide view that's great for general yes but can you digitally zoom in on a face it's getting better and better so okay. we've been doing panoramic vision for quite a number of years we have intellectual property behind it we have a deep you know yes you know almost up to 50 ecosystem technology partners that have integrated our proprietary SDK and so in that entire tenure we're getting resolution at scale. So we started oh. at two megapixel, and now we're actually up to 14 megapixel, which 14. is higher than 4K. That's right. Really? That's well, right. this my little GoPro shoots in 4K. The mistake I made is yep. I loaded it on my old PC. So 8.3 technically megapixel, right? Yeah, yep. and, and YouTube stopped loading it because it was too big. That is right. So yep. that's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, that was my concern. I love the 360, but I'm thinking, can I legally still see the guy's face? Now, exactly. This still is about placement. You still need the right designer to say, yes, I got a 360 camera. Mm -hmm. I probably still shouldn't put it up in the corner. And maybe Correct. if I put it at a lower level, yep. how how close can I put this to make it an effective panoramic? What I so, used to do is put cameras in light switches at doors. Right. So when you walked out the door, I had your entire head yep. on camera, right? Or does this need to be a wider view to start to get the, the wider view? The field? point is you shouldn't you shouldn't guess, right? right. You should never guess. You, you know, a security director or a system integrator should should know going in at what height, at what distance, you know, is my pixel density going to equate a usable image for forensics? So we actually created a little app on your iPhone with your thumb. You can answer a couple variable questions and literally give you and show you a representation of the image of what you're going to get oh, that's at what distance. Anybody so else do that? I don't think you can do that right now. No, does can, anybody else do that? I haven't heard of that. Yeah, you can go to century360.com and right there we have our calculator. You can pull it up on your phone and while you're walking a site, you can say, okay, this is nine feet tall. I want to use maybe a four, a three megapixel camera and right. because my, my, my door distance is 10 feet. And your software like is going to recommend the right... Absolutely. We're going to recommend part numbers. We're even going to show you the pixels per foot density and an, a, an approximate image quality representation based on your calculations. Well, you don't need me as a security consultant anymore. My job's done. It's a it's a tool, <laughs> right? We, yeah. we still have a very important You always need human a human factor. element. Absolutely. What? So I see a lot of camera people. I visit sure. a lot of people. Uh, my general feel is this is a leader company right here. You have some advanced stuff that most people don't have. You're taking the lead on. Am I wrong? We're a very focused company, Chuck. I, I uh, you know, we there's a lot of different vendors here at this trade show. We've been a vendor here. Uh, uh, we've had a stand here for about five years in a row. Uh, Nobody has an app that I know of, and I ask everybody. I like that app thing. That's amazing. It's, it's we want to create an experience with the end user, with the system integrator that sets us aside um, in, in every way. And so, part of our field of view calculators, our bandwidth calculators, our storage calculators is and our, and our um, image quality configuration tools, is they're free assets, free tools that people can use on the fly. And our entire goal in the design was, we want people to do it with their thumb. Right. Everything, I'm checking my bank statements, I'm checking That's my true. email, I'm you know maybe trading a stock here or there, or something like that, with my thumb. I should be able to design video surveillance systems with that as well. Now, you seem a little different also than most camera manufacturers make a fantastic product. Thank you. And then, their job is, put in a box and it's out the door. Sure. I see more integration on your part. Yeah. I see more design on your part. We are a solution right. focused, customer centric organization. Yeah. That's what we are. Um, we are not about selling a box or a lens or, a, or just a camera. We are about high level customer engagement. Um, and that is how we've grown. We've grown over 300% in, 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 in less than two years. And the reason we've done that, Chuck, is because we're, we're putting the customer foot first, and it's all about the experience. So let's talk about integration. Please. I'm worried about it because it's a great thing, but it's also not a tin can and a wire, right. which was simple but secure in yep. a way, right? 
So when I put your cameras on my network and I put the HR system on there and the guard and the key watch, the pro all the things, very convenient. Integration is great for doing data analysis, sure. right? But my hacker now has access to everything. What do you recommend for that? Uh, you know, to help with that. I mean, just changing the password maybe is not enough to change the password on your camera. By the way, for my nieces and nephews who don't get this stuff, right. cameras are computers now. You can just say that's a computer on the wall and right. it has an IP address. That's a good way to look at it. Um, that's a really you know, fantastic topic. Um, Cybersecurity is a huge secure. It's, 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 it's not yet in this industry, but it's, it's going to be in a major, major way. You don't think it's hit um, cameras quite as hard? I think, unfortunately, it has. With some, so There's been some, some news lately that, that is actually, there is an infection point of, of uh, broken code that has actually happened with some hackers oh, and, okay. and products that actually has happened here recently. I've read some articles on it, so we're really concerned about it. Yeah. Um, we're dealing and developing network devices and network devices can be exposed. And uh, uh, I think our industry in a whole needs to take careful aim and focus on improving. We are in the security industry, but cybersecurity in the, in the physical realm has not been a, a, a big priority. It's like and an afterthought. Unfortunately yeah. it is, and I will tell you for our company, we're extremely focused on developing eight, eight, eight to, uh, government standards, uh, They've come out recently with a new set of standards for secure devices. Right. Um, we, we already have HTTPS uh, in, in, encryption, um, but that's not good enough. We need to continue to innovate um, because our entire philosophy, you know, in the next 10 years of our company is intelligence at the edge. Are we okay? getting to the point where we can use cameras for prevention? And that sounds like a loaded question because people assume cameras are prevention. Correct. But as you know, unless I have a guy sitting there 24 hours a day, which you can't do, because his yep. eyes roll up in his head and he gets bored. Sure. Uh, how is the software getting improving to alert people to say, hey, we have an issue, we can track this guy through a system. Um, by the way, this guy's appeared in this camera every Tuesday at four o'clock and it's not to get a Starbucks, sure. he's doing something. What, how, are we, how are we doing with the prediction using video? Um, there's a couple companies in our, that are partners of ours that are doing behavioral analysis. Based on just the video. So, so they're, they're on, so, but you're only as smart you know, with, with your two you know, variables. How, what is the quality of information that you're, you're seeing? Right. And, num and number two, what is the field of view? So, so we, we, we try to position ourselves to, to align ourselves with the video analytic manufacturers that we can give a user with one license a panoramic view that's intelligent. Instead of a narrow field of view that's low resolution, maximize the power of that intelligent uh, video with panoramic vision. The reason I, I say it is I, I teach a class and one of the things we show is the actual terrorists from the London train bombs. Yeah. This busy platform, and I'm thinking about your train stations yep. in Chicago, right? Huge platform, people's coming and going, and I ask the people in the class, which one's a terrorist? And we go, ah, I don't know. But then when we teach the class, you go, oh yeah, it's these three guys. And what they did is they basically all converged and they looked up at the camera and they stared at the camera for two or three seconds. Sure. And everybody else is frozen, wa right. everybody's walking around, these guys are frozen, right? And that's what I was thinking, you know, if there's an algorithm that said that people that stare at cameras, we should watch them. Right. People that come to a train station and, uh, you know, carry a lot of luggage, we should watch them. I don't know, that might not be the right an algorithm, but it's something like that I think we could do. And as the resolution improves, and that's we right. can see the keys in the guy's wallet, and maybe we'll be able to read the key number, it's, you know. In order to, to get information, you have to have accurate, precise yeah. data and in video, that means pixel density and image quality. So you're up to 4K, and I thought I thought I saw somebody that said they had a 7K camera, and I thought, what can you play it back on, mm -hmm. right? Because now the technology Very good resolution's so good that my TV at home would blow up if I tried to sure. play it on there. Uh, but it's getting there. Well, uh, this has been a great uh, a great conversation. I really talk. enjoyed I'm, it, Chuck. It's third time's a charm, right? We you tried to it. do it in Atlanta <laughs> and right. Vegas, and we missed. We were waiting for the best but part. But I'm glad we missed it. So give me your website for everybody to... Uh, www.sentry360.com, century360.com. And you're located in Chicago? Outside Chicago, we have an office uh, in, in Southern California, an office in Bangalore, an office in uh, Istanbul, and in Dubai. Excellent, thanks for coming on Security Guy Radio. Thank you, Chuck. That was great. Yeah, that was a lot Very of fun. Good. Very Thank good, you, sir. Yeah, it's just a conversation, right? Exactly. We're not... yeah. All right, welcome to Security Guy Ready. What's your name, sir? Jesse Chen with VivoTech. Of course, I know that because Jesse Te Chen from VivoTech is one of my favorite vendors. Ah, thank you. You guys had the best stuff. It's unbelievable. Ah, thank you. What's new today? Uh, so what we're showing here is uh, we're actually showing an H.265 product. 
We have the FD8171-HT. It's a three megapixel indoor dome with a remote focus and WDR. And it also has H.265. So what we have on this display right here is we have two of them side by side. One's on H.265, one's on H.264. And we're showing the bandwidth difference. That's a, it's like, well, it's more than half. Right now it's showing half. Yesterday it was mostly around 40%, but yeah, we're getting lucky right now at, at 50, it looks like half. Now, what's what's a price point on things like this? Uh, so the MSRP on that model right there is 900. So it's very much the same as our current H.264 lineup. That's very reasonable to me. Very reasonable. Where would you apply this? Who you know what? Who's your end user on this? Because it's pretty high end stuff, right? But it's anywhere where bandwidth limit. There's bandwidth limitations. So now you could, if you couldn't get three or five megapixel before, because of bandwidth issues, right. or you know you couldn't deploy 20, 30 of these in in, the, in that opportunity. Now you could get that bandwidth down and, and get higher resolution. Are you finding that this is the challenge in the biz, the bandwidth thing? There's multiple challenges, but that is one of them. Yeah, yeah I, I just find that although they say there's bandwidth, it seems like, I don't know if we're running out of it or what it is. It's, or there's just more people in the space yeah, or what? It's also bandwidth. It's also storage as well. Come up a little higher in the mic. Just it's say. storage as well. Storage, right? Okay, yeah. so what's the recommended storage on something like this? Um, it depends on the opportunity. For instance, if there's a certain type of... Uh, certain industry and they have a certain regulation they might require 30 60 90 days of retention well, that's true we have compliance so issues something yeah. that requires 90 days you're going to want something with like h.265 to get use up less hard drive space so i'm not i mean the quality in that's unbelievable mm -hmm. and we're showing it right here with one of our partners genetech right on security center and they are supporting h.265 already too so we partner with them to display and i say that's a pretty awesome image i'm going to zoom in on this a little bit here all right all right. I mean, that that's such high resolution. It's unbelievable. And mm -hmm. how, let's say this camera was five years ago. How much how much bandwidth was it using back then uh, for this quality? For I, storage? I don't remember. We didn't it's have a lot, right? Like double have, or we something. We didn't have a three megapixel five years ago. Well, that's true. That's yeah. true. But the point of this is we're, we have a super high resolution and, mm -hmm. and much lower storage. Yes. Now, is that a compression ratio? Is it an algorithm? How do you guys get it down so low? I'd have to bring my sales engineer into that to answer, help answer that. But it's 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 a secret sauce in the H.265 that <laughs> I'm not privy to. That's I all right. <laughs> That's all right. All right. Very and this camera is available in November. Oh, it's brand new again. Every time yeah. I come here, you guys got a brand new camera. How many new cameras do you guys roll out a year? Uh, probably at least 20 to 30, sometimes more Serious? than that. Yeah. Vivotech, my favorite camera vendor, I'm telling you. How's sales, by the way? Sales are going good. Any big projects like that people would know about or should know about? Or? Uh, I don't really want to talk about those. That means there are some, though. There are some. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'd rather not uh, let any of my competition know. All right. Well, that's a good point. That's a very good point. All right. Let me get a close-up on this thing so we can see that camera. Mm -hmm. All right. That's the one right there and available on your website, right? Uh, it will soon be on the website. Probably, probably at the end of October, we'll post it on the website. Now, if somebody watches this, and we hope somebody does watch my show, mm -hmm. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, could mm -hmm. they get a hold of you now to uh, mm -hmm. start looking at this product? Uh, they could email us at salesusa at vivotech.com or they could call our number in San Jose, 408-773-8686. Right. You got another thing you want to show me? Yes, I do. All right, let's move it on over. Okay. So what we have here is kind of a, a overall showing a lot of our fisheye products. Okay. Previously, I showed you you know, our, our IR fisheye and some of the yeah, other Yeah, that's ones. almost the right angle one, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, Look how many we have now. So we have a 12 megapixel with IRs. We have a five megapixel. We have a smaller one right here. That's an indoor one. We got our 180 vandal proof one I showed you. That's ISC one I liked, West. right? Yep. Yeah. So is that camera on this display here? Because before we go, I want to show that to everybody again. It's mm -hmm. an amazing camera. Is that one no. hot? That one right now is very popular. Yeah. Everyone we introduce it to is very much inclined to. to yeah, the last show I was standing in front of the camera and it it projected almost a right angle to me. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Now, is that achieved through software manipulation? Uh, it's, you know, we set the fish eye to just be at a one eight, at a one. Is that the camera? Yeah. Okay. So not doing any de-warping here like our ceiling mount fish eyes. We're right. just doing it as a 180. All right, so this is the camera right here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stand And if you look right here. Back. Good thing you have a long cable. Yeah, walk to the side, okay. All right, now stay there. All right, so here's where Jesse is on, on the camera, but look where he is in reality. He's mm -hmm. almost flush to the camera and exactly. monitor. That's unbelievable. Thank you. Unbelievable. You guys so must that, be the best at that. Are you the best at that? 
I, I'd say with the fisheye stuff, we were the best at it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't even consider that fisheye. I mean, it, it's it's even less warping than a GoPro, and that's really a fisheye, mm -hmm. really. That's really amazing. Yeah. And one really of the great good. things about this is it's it's it sticks on a wall. It's pretty flush. Um, and you're doing just one sensor as opposed to the multi-sensor 180s, right. which we are releasing one as well now. But compared to that, you're using one sensor as opposed to four. So the bandwidth, storage quality, storage limitations, I mean, are much reduced. Now, why do you need this one up here, a 180 view, if it's already fisheye? Uh, that one will get you further coverage. <laughs> How much more could you have than everything? That's amazing. Well, Let's see. Can we see it? Oh, that'd be great. We can see so it. So it's right down here. Okay. So if you look at the bottom of the screen here, that is the multi-sensor 180. So it's uh, four three megapixel. Wait a second, that's that's stitched together. So the software is stitching these together. Mm -hmm. I'm looking. Is that 360? Uh, it's 180. 180. But what we're seeing here, as opposed to the previous one we looked at, it doesn't have a warp view. It does not have a warp view. Because it's flat. stitching together. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's it's you know they're for different things. If you want to cover 15 feet to 20 feet away, you could go with this one. Right. If you want to cover further, like a parking lot, or, or you know a, a soccer field or something like that, you could go with this one. What's that one cost? Uh, the MSRP we're projecting at two about two thousand right now. You know, it saves you're not buying 20 cameras, you're buying one. That's a good deal. Exactly. Let me take a look. It's right up there, hanging right. Yeah. yeah and it does come with uh, high intensity IR illuminators above it. That is amazing. Look at that. 180 view. So this camera, we'll go back on a little bit. See mm -hmm. mounted up there. That camera is taking a picture of yeah. all this stuff right here at a right angle. Exactly. That's amazing. All right, you got to put some of this stuff in my house. I know it's overkill, <laughs> but it'd just be fun to watch it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Right, just uh, send me an email, and I'll get you one right, of them. Now let's talk about integration. I'm talking about integration uh, this mm -hmm. year at the show, right? Here's what I'm worried about. We don't have a tin can and a wire anymore, the low technology. Everything's high tech. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to integrate with my system, and now I'm the end user and I have access to cameras, which are computers mm -hmm. now, and they're on the network, right? Mm -hmm. And I can also get into the HR system for SAP, and I can get in the access control system. And that's great for me to mm -hmm. interface all those things and share. Mm -hmm. But the hacker, the bad guy, that's great for him too. So what do we do in the camera world to protect ourselves? There was a, I think I talked to you last show, that guy that had the website where he just put all the default passwords that are in systems. You know, most cameras are shipped with 009 or password. Oh, yeah. And he was looking at baby monitors and people's houses and all kinds of stuff. So since that's a camera now, and it's also a computer in a way, what do you do on the encryption side when you ship? I know you manufacture and you ship it off, and I know you're kind of done before the installation, but what do you put inside that to make that more secure for the installer? Well... We do definitely recommend that when installing our products, you change the default password. Yeah. Don't leave it as admin, admin, or anything like that. Change it to secure password because otherwise everyone could get could buy another camera and they can know what the default password is. Well, and this is, is what I try to tell people when I do consulting on this stuff, that these manufacturers are unbelievable. The technology is great. But guess what? They're the manufacturer, mm -hmm. right? And they're going to get you up to a certain point, and the integration mm -hmm. and the installation is, is key. Yeah. Now, do you guys belong to places like, you know, ONVIF and, the, you know, those yeah, organizations? Yeah, okay. part of ONVIF. So ONVIF, I forgot what the acronym stands for. Basically, it's an organization where a high-tech company share mm -hmm. the data, try to standardize these mm -hmm. things so they become more secure. Uh, you're not really competing, which is interesting. I mean, Sony yeah. has cameras, you have cameras, but yeah. you're trying to make sure that the platform is the same. So yeah. explain a little bit about that. Well, I, I don't think ONVIF is as, and I could be wrong, but I don't think ONVIF is as much of a, of a security protocol for cameras to no not with, security but yeah. standards right so yeah. if one guy has a low-end camera that has no security they're probably not going to belong to on the way i look at it is uh a long time ago when you installed a printer to your computer using usb you had to install a driver still right nowadays you plug in a usb and it automatically loads it up and it's ready to go so, so are, I, are your cameras plug and play is that kind of the idea i see that well that's what i think on is trying to be is plug and play compatible oh i see what you're saying and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, Nah, it might be good in some applications. It might not be. Yeah. You know. There's Who a lot of specific applications and features in different cameras right. that there's not enough on Viv protocols to. Who's uh, who's Vivotech's big end users? Um, is, it more, is it more corporate? Is it more um, you know, is it retail? Or is we it have a bit of both. We have a lot of retail customers right now. Um, like this, this looks like retail stuff in a lot of ways, right? 
Speaking of retail, I'll show you the, what uh, the retailers are really interested in right now. Oh, not this stuff. Other they things. They are interested in these. Right. But I'll show you the All right, next let's go look at that. All right, great. I've got to uh, see what I'm looking at here. So, uh, sorry, I, I, I misunderstood the last question. Uh, uh, the segments that we do really well in right now are retail. Um, we're doing we're picking up in banking education market we've always done well in and we're doing some more and uh, we're getting more involved with healthcare industries as well. Oh, healthcare is big. Yeah, yeah. So it's so funny. I talk to people in healthcare stuff, mm -hmm. and you know they're required right to do all mm -hmm. these things. They're mm -hmm. not necessarily doing them. They're getting there. They're trying to. It's yeah. kind of driven by budgets and stuff. Let me take a quick check of my sound here. Hold on. Okay. Sometimes we need to move these little mics. All right, we're good. We can cut that out. All right. All right, back. So what I wanted to show you over here when we said uh, retail yeah. is this right here. That is a fisheye camera in a recessed mount. You get a shot of that. Just that small one in the middle? Yeah, and we offer it in both a, a black cover or a white cover. That is really small. Yeah, and it's a five megapixel fisheye. It will do the same de-warping like our other fisheyes do that we've seen in the past. Just smaller. Yeah, I mean, you really smaller. you would not know that's a camera. You certainly wouldn't know it's a high end. Yeah, so the one camera. thing we found with retailers and, and banking and and you know hospitality industries, any place where they've done a lot of design aesthetics, they oh, don't yeah. want a big camera. No, they don't want in there. No, right, right. But they do want some functionality with it still. So you we're giving them a fisheye in that small design. Like, Is that on uh, on a shot we could see? Uh, yeah. Let me scoot them over. Oh, good. So if we see right here, we have it also available in a... Oh, how it drops housing. down. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. So it's kind of like a teardrop shape. Yeah. And again, we have it and you could do black or white. And right now on these ones, we're showing those are 1080p uh, with WDR. All right. So that's what we have down here. This is the bottom shot right there. Mm-hmm. That is an amazing picture. And then the last thing we have is this image right here. It's a little hazy, but uh, we have a pinhole camera coming out now. Okay, now that I have to have. I got. I say I have to buy all these gadgets. That's amazing. Take a picture of that. All right. So that's that's a very clear shot, mm -hmm. and it's coming from this <laughs> from this little hole right here. This guy right here. Now keep your finger there. That's some, see, but it, I, it's amazing. It's flush, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm still getting a great shot, all you know, almost 180. Yeah, it's a it's a 1080p with WDR. Unfortunately, at these trade shows, we can't really demonstrate WDR that well because right. there's no sunlight coming in. Right. Yeah. But going back to the recess cameras, this is the actual size of it. It's a two-inch hole saw, and it's all PoE, and it goes in the ceiling like that. How easy is that? And this is just a magnet. Right. And you could tilt the lens with a Phillips screwdriver. That's amazing. Take, show the backside to my uh, nieces and nephews so they understand. Yeah, it's like it's a it's an yeah. IP connection. Yeah, and it's got my no more hardware too. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Now is that for local storage in case something goes down? You have the last hour on there exactly. or something. You could do some, oh, fabulous. some backup uh, with different softwares. You could actually sometimes have some edge recording to it too. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Any sound on these things? This one does have a mic input as well. I love coming to this show. So, I, love, I love coming to your booth. It's amazing. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the MSRP on the, the 1080p version is 375. That's it. Yeah. And the fisheye version is uh, 500. All right. So now I'm thinking, uh, being crazy like me, mm -hmm. I don't want to buy one of these. I mean, I could buy this and put it in my house. Mm -hmm. I got Cat Five in my house, right? Yeah. And literally, I could buy that, plug it into my network, and I got a camera, right? Exactly. That's amazing. Exactly. Very, very interesting. Jesse, so just email me and I'll, I'll get you the inside deal. Absolutely. Well, thank you very okay. much. Thanks for taking care of Security Guy Radio. I appreciate no it. Problem. Jesse, thanks for coming on again. A thanks pleasure. Again, Chuck. All right. Thank you so much.